Hey folks, today at Pony Box Wood Shop, I'm gonna show you seven tips and four myths that are gonna make you a better woodworker. So if you're like me, when you first started woodworking, you couldn't really afford a $2,000 table saw to rip down full sheets of plywood. Heck, I can't afford one now, which is why I have a five or $600 track saw that works really great. But before that, I had some scrap wood and this old circular saw, and I made a straight edge it took me about five minutes to make in the shop and it's lasted me for years. And this thing works excellent. And it doesn't have the dust collection or the plunge capability as the track saw, but this really did well for several years for me. And I'm gonna show you how I did it. And it works with any circular saw you have in your shop, whether it's battery operated or corded one, even one like this one that I've cut the cord in half at least 12 times and taped it back together. So I'm gonna show you real quick how I made this one. And I promise you it's well worth doing because it's really gonna come in handy in your shop. Okay, real easy concept. You just need a piece of quarter inch material, MDF, plywood, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then a three quarter inch piece of wood on the top. This is about an inch and a half wide. When you attach your piece to the quarter inch ply, you just need to make sure that this is good and wide. I'd start out 10, 11 inches at least. Um, I think mine is around final length, nine and a half inches. So if you keep that about 11 inches, that should give you plenty. When you attach your strip to the top, just make sure it's square to the edge and then leave an inch and a half or so on the back side and go ahead and attach it to your quarter inch piece. Now this distance between your guide and the outside of the quarter inch ply is gonna be greater than what your saw is and your saw is gonna sit up. What you're gonna do is just start your saw and then run it down and cut the excess off making sure that that plate stays right up against your guide right here. What that's gonna do is it's going to customize this straight edge for your saw. You're going to make a cut, you make your two marks, you lay it down and put your outer edge right here, right on your mark on both sides, and then you can just make that cut all the way down. The reason why you leave the overhang on the other side is that's how you clamp it to the piece that you're cutting. Works great. So if I'm being honest, I'm pretty mediocre at best when it comes to math, and I've kind of had to fight through it my entire woodworking career. But these next few steps have really helped me out in the shop, and there's something I wanted to share with you. So let's get into some measuring tips. So let's say if you got a board that's at a width and a little bit hard to do math with. So this board's at eight and seven sixteenths inches wide, and I need to divide this board into equal parts, whether it's in half or by five. The easiest way to do that is to just turn your tape measure keeping this edge flush against this edge of the board, and then turning this to a number that's easy for you to do math with. So I'm gonna turn this one to 10, and I'm gonna leave that right at 10, and then at right at half of that, at five inches, I'm gonna make a mark. Now that mark is gonna be at dead center of this board, and you can check it by measuring this way, and then again this way, and it should be the exact same measurement. But that is the easiest way to divide this board in half. Now let's say I wanna divide it into five equal parts. Same thing applies. Just turn your tape measure to whatever number is easy for you. And I'm gonna do, again, 10 inches. Now, if I wanna do five equal parts, I'll just make a mark at two, four, six, and eight. Now I have five equal parts on this board that are the exact same width all the way across. This works with any number. If I wanna find the dead center again, and let's say I go all the way to, let's go 20. I make a mark at 10. It's gonna be the exact same place as my mark before. That has saved me so much time and headache in the shop throughout the years that it's one of my favorite tips for sure. The next tip is to have a carpenter square in your wood shop. This thing is not just for rough construction and has a ton of different functions. Let me show you a few of them. All right, on to the specifics of the carpenter square. The things that it is great for, which are the most obvious, is it can go up against the edge of your board, make a 90 degree line and also make a 45 degree line. That's really nice and handy in a wood shop. You can always have this just to throw down, make those two lines really quick. It has a ruler on this side up to seven inches and then it's got some scrub lines on the inside. They start at one inch, go up to two and a quarter inch. So you can put that pencil right in that scrub line and then move it down your board and make a scrub line one inch from your edge all the way down. It's perfect. Like I said, it goes all the way up to two and a quarter inches. On this side, you have degrees. So you have a pivot point here. It actually says pivot point. Keep that flush against your board and then move this edge, lining up the number 
of whatever degree that you want to mark to this edge. So let's say if you want to make a 20 degree line, you line up 20 degrees to that edge, keeping the pivot point tight, make your mark, and that is a 20 degree angle. Pretty easy. This is a very versatile tool. It's very useful to have in any wood shop, and I highly recommend having one of those in there. Our next tip is how to find the center of any circle. Doesn't matter the size, and you don't have to do any math. All you need is a construction triangle and a square. Place them together so that the right angle of the square meets right at the angle of the triangle. Once they're together, use you a clamp to clamp it in place. Just makes it easier to handle. And then you place your circle, whatever size circle, doesn't matter whatever it is, right there at the right angle of your square. Make you a mark, turn it a little bit, make you a new mark. And the intersection of those two marks is the exact center of your circle. Doesn't matter what size circle you have, it'll always find the direct center of the circle. This has served me well over the years. It's a great tip, very easy to use, and there is no math involved. So this next tip is also one that I use quite a bit in the shop, and it is for when you need to attach a board to another board, but you don't want to ruin either one of them and you can't use clamps. You don't want to just use some CA glue and glue this board to that one. You'll never get it off without ruining one of the boards. So this comes in handy when you're doing pattern routing on the router table, or you're using table saw sleds or planer sleds, and you don't need this board to move at all. This is the way to do it. Take you some regular painter's tape, put it down on one of the surfaces of your boards. Take your second piece of painter's tape, place it on one of your other boards that you need to attach in the same spot. Take some CA glue. I like to use Star Bond. Put a little bit down on the painter's tape. If you want to get real fancy, use some accelerator. That makes it dry real fast. And then place the painter's tape on top of the painter's tape. Within a few seconds, this board is completely attached to this board and it's not going anywhere. You can run this through the router, do a straight edge, do a pattern, whatever you needed to do. And this board is attached to this board very well. The key to this is when you go to remove this board from this board, the painter tape's gonna tear and it's not gonna affect either one of the boards, just like this. There you go. So the painter tape stuck together. Take that painter tape off. There is no damage to either one of the boards and you secured this board to that board temporarily, no problems. Works great. It is something very handy in the shop. I'm sure you can come up with a thousand different applications for that. Our next tip has to do with glue. And glue can be a bit of a pain in the butt, especially when you're dealing with these little bottles like this to come from the store. These things you gotta pull up and down and they're always getting stuck with excess glue. You gotta take needle nose pliers and pull all the crap out. And most of the time they don't seal and they don't work great anyway. So get rid of them. Get yourself some cheap squeeze bottles from Amazon. They work awesome for glue application. Also, you can order them in bulk and they work great for oil when you're cooking and barbecue sauce. So I keep three or four of these in the shop at all times. You can cut the tips off to however you like um, for glue to come out at whatever pace and they're easy to fill up. Just take the top off, grab yourself your big bottle of glue, pour it in. And if you order the same ones that I do, they have these little caps on them, so it keeps everything from drying out or spilling. It's a lot better than these applicators you have to push up and down. And they never really work. And if you were working for any amount of time, you know what I'm talking about. Get these. So the last tip I have for you before we move on to the myths of woodworking comes from a video that I watched early on in woodworking from the Wood Whisperer. It's called A Trip to the Lumber Yard. And I'll put a direct link to it down in the description section. Mark Spagnola does a phenomenal job of explaining how to shop for hardwoods at a lumber yard. Now the difference is at a big box store, they sell lumber in linear feet and in a lumber yard or a lumber dealer, they sell hardwoods in the board feet. And board feet can be a little confusing and intimidating to the beginning woodworker and a little hard to figure out. So basically a board foot is 144 cubic inches. And that's a board that's one foot by one foot by one inch thick. So if you have a board, if you multiply the length times the width 
times the thickness, divide that by 144, then you have your board feet. If you're like me, you need a calculator and a tape measure to do that. And if you forget that, a good rule of thumb and the biggest tip that I got away from his video is that if you have a board that is eight foot long, six inches wide, and one inch thick, which is commonly referred to as four quarter, then that board is four board feet. If you keep that in mind, it makes things a little bit easier and you can kind of move through the lumber yard, figuring out what kind of pricings you're gonna have at the end. All right, I hope those tips are gonna be beneficial to you and it's time now to ruffle a few feathers and move on to the myths of woodworking. This is the fun part. All right, for our first myth and one that drives me absolutely insane is that you need biscuits or dominoes to add strength to your panels. Not true. These little guys are not gonna add strength to any panel. Whether it's a tabletop, a cutting board, I don't care what it is, they're not adding any strength. These are for alignment. As long as your boards are milled up correctly, as long as you have a good glue joint, you don't even need these. I rarely use them. The only time that I use them is when I have a long tabletop or some boards that aren't really wanting to cooperate and I need some alignment help. That's what these are for. Even dominoes, I know they're bigger, I know they're thicker, I know they add strength, but it's unnecessarily adding strength. Those things are expensive. You don't need them. The only time you need them is for alignment, not strength. And don't let anybody else tell you differently. Our next myth in woodworking are pocket holes are only used by people who suck at woodworking. It's not true. Pocket holes are a great tool to have in your shop. There is a time and a place for every type of joinery. Cabinet makers use these every day. I will say they have gotten a bad rap because people have not researched the right way to use these in the right situation. So make sure you research, you know when to use them, and they're going to be an excellent tool for you, especially for the beginning woodworker. So don't let anybody shame you about using pocket holes. They're actually really good. I use them all the time. So a pretty common myth on the miter saw is that you need a zero clearance to reduce tear out. And that's not technically true. So a miter saw cuts in an upward motion, unlike a table saw that cuts in a downward motion. The zero clearance in a table saw makes a big difference when it comes to tear out. And the miter saw, it's not really gonna make any difference. You can pretty much take this completely out and you're gonna get the same amount of tear out uh, as you do with a zero clearance in. It's really gonna matter about what type of blade that you have and a good quality blade. It's gonna make a big difference on that. The one thing a zero clearance can help with is reducing the tiny little slivers, and if I could get these out in mine, that fall down in there. So if you wanna make a zero clearance for the miter saw just to reduce for the amount of stuff that falls down in there, that's fine. For me, I'll just take it off and uh, clear that out every now and then. Doesn't really hurt anything. The last myth in woodworking we're gonna talk about is you gotta have expensive tools to make nice things. That's not true. Expensive tools are nice and sometimes you get what you pay for, but you don't have to have expensive tools to do nice woodworking projects. Just not true. I started out with Harbor Freight tools, Chicago brand stuff that was the most inexpensive thing you could buy. And I made some really nice stuff for our family. My wife loved it, I loved it, it was very functional, and a lot of that stuff I still have in my house to this day. Now over the years, it's been nice to upgrade to more expensive tools that are more accurate, make the job easier, and there's nothing wrong with that either. There's a lot of people out there making some really nice stuff with tools that don't cost that much. Most of my tools come from Craigslist and Black Friday deals, so buy what you can afford, get what you think is nice, and just go from there. Well, that does it for all the tips, tricks, and myths for today. But as usual, I got another video right there teed up for you, which I know you'll love it. And don't forget all the tools and everything that I use in this video. They'll have direct affiliate links in the description section below. Anytime you use those, it supports the channel, and I truly appreciate it. We'll see you on the next one.